Okay, uh, and uh, basically, what what I've learned over the years, and which all of you know, and certainly Andy, you know it from the work you've done on inquiry, uh, that uh, the idea of technically redesigning a system, you know, deciding what the structure and processes are, you know, that's a wonderful intellectual exercise that we can all engage in, and, and we know a lot about it. Uh, about how to redesign an organization. Uh, that's what we're all interested in. Uh, but basically, you know, my years in practice taught me and my years later taught me that, uh, hey, uh, there's this problem called people and uh, they need to be uh, sign on. Uh, they're gonna have new roles, new responsibilities, new relationships, uh, new decision rights. Uh, some of those are going to seen, be, be seen as wins, and some of them, are, by many, going to be seen as losses. Uh, I, can, I can't go into all of that, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so uh, the idea that people need to be involved in this process is critical. And, uh, and what is that role? Well, in most organizations, that role is the senior management decides, and they communicate, and they try to sell. And they try to use rational analysis and rational arguments why this is necessary. Uh, well, it turns out that that's not so effective, is it? Um, and they, they, they launch a variety of programs to move it along. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so I have, uh, as a result of a 30-year collaboration uh, with Becton Dickinson and, then late, and after, shortly after that with hundreds of other organizations, uh, but at Becton Dickinson, uh, uh, we had a key question. I'm going to get to that. All, most of the stuff I'm talking about here is I'm going to talk about. Let's see. I can move these slides along. I'm not having a bit bit of a problem with that. Why is that? Um, hmm. uh, let's see. Why am I having trouble with these slides? There we go. Um, uh, I, most of what I'm going to say is in uh, fit to compete, although some of it is it, it, the, the book emphasizes this notion of honest, collective and public conversation. That is that the consultant, the, the scholar consultant, that's basically what I have been. I've been a researcher, an academic, but also a consultant and usually working in both those in that spirit in both things. So what I'm saying what this book is about and what I'm saying in the last 30 years has come out of an action research process. I work with managers to try to help them improve uh, and deal with a certain problem. Uh, and I observe, I take notes, I research. The book describes the a variety of research methods we use to try to understand what was going on. Uh, none of them meet the total standard of normal science, but together I think they brought uh, a clarity about what was going on. Uh, what motivated this book was actually this question by Ray Gil Martin, then CEO of Becton Dickinson in 1990. Uh, we have great strategy. We cannot execute it effectively. Indeed, top management had all been, including Gil Martin, strategy consultants with some of the best consulting firms in the world 
You can imagine McKinsey uh, was one of them. Uh, Boston Consulting Group, another. I think Phil Martin came out of Arthur D. Little. Uh, and, uh, and he asked a second question. Can you help us become a company capable of executing strategy? Over the years, by the way, the word strategy has broadened to include the overall direction of the company from a values and purpose point of view. It doesn't matter how you define the direction. What I'm going to be talking about is that it requires some understanding of the organization's current state and in a process and a way to improve it and change it, redesign it, the system. So underlying this concept is the notion of systems, that organizations are not just structure, they're not just leaders, they're not just skills and capabilities uh, of individuals, they're not just how we promote and, and you know the, the HR system, they're all of these things, things interacting together. So let me just start a small conversation, uh, just a few minutes. What would be your, re your guess as to why it is they cannot execute their strategy? I mean, these are sophisticated people and a, and a company that was, you know, 1.5 billion 30 years ago and now is about an $18 billion company in the uh, global medical technology. Uh, it's a global medical technology company. Why, why would they have trouble? Anybody want to pipe up? Um, I think one of the reasons is they may not, you know, um, well, at least in the, you know, in the former years when senior uh, sort of stakeholders designed strategy, they never thought it to be, they never thought it uh, good enough to consult the individuals who were going to be delivering the strategy. Yeah. Um, and I think the context of the employee or the individual was not always taken into account, but mostly the customer and the market. And I think, um, which is one reason why um, strategy fails as well. Okay, yep. So consulting with people, all the stakeholders, enough of the stakeholders to know what's going on, yep. Yes, I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, now, anybody else? What, what about the, um, the reality of the strategy? So what does it actually look like? Because again, if you've got like a closed room of people who have a vision, but they can never describe what the reality of that would look like for the workforce or for the customers. Right. So, so you stating don't have to get what there. you right, stating what you want to do requires some vision, some way of thinking about how you would put things together. Who who sh the a simple uh, simple sim the way we simplify it is sometimes to say who what's the problem and who does who, what people need to talk to each other about that problem and in what way do they need to talk to it to them about it. In other words, the quality of that conversation, all, all that matters. And it's what we call organizing, right? We create structures to do it. We create processes to do it. And they may not have had a clear understanding of that, or they had the wrong structure and, and the wrong organizing uh, model uh, in, in place. Uh, and we know that organizing models grow out of history, right? So the past informs the current state and the future in many people's eyes, and uh, and they may not know that, and 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 that's a that's a key. So the, in often true that people do that. Senior management. One of the premises here is senior management does not know the whole truth about how about what it is in the organization that's really holding them back, or if they know it rationally, they have not incorporated it, it, it emotionally. And this is very critical. We started with the premise that organizing was a rational process. And we, you know all the stuff about organizing systems, redesign, we, we knew that stuff. Organizations have to fit the strategy. But what we learned over time and what was, I mean, we sort of knew it, but we just have really deeply began to understand it is that incorporating a redesign involves emotions of leaders and followers all the way through the organization. Uh, is that a hand up? Is that, is that right? Um, I just wanted to quickly find something else, which is an observation, Michael, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so uh, I think one of the other things is that organizations are sort of contested arenas. And there's a lot of times there's sort of, you know, hubris and egos that drive, uh, you know, yeah. 
and yeah. because there's not enough enough sort of psychological safety for employees to raise their hand and say we're going in the wrong direction yeah 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 um, you know so that's that's the other thing that i've noticed oh absolutely this is a key to the whole thing people truth cannot speak to power uh, you know, in varying degrees in, in really sick organizations or in organizations that are kind of stuck. And those are the organizations we have tend to work. And, and Beckton Dickinson was stuck. It was not a bad organization. This was not a horrible organization. Gil Martin was not a dictator. Uh, he was a rational, very smart Harvard Business School graduate, you know, consultant, you know, really knew his stuff. But the ability of getting that conversation going and what you can learn from it is one of the keys here. And that, that's really what this is all about. But the conversation has to be really about the real stuff, right? About what the, how, it can't be any conversation. It's gotta be around some, are we in the, heading in the wrong direction or whatever? Uh, let me let me keep uh, going. Michael, just a couple of process, yeah, Michael, just a couple of process suggestions. Uh, there's actually some comments in chat, but I think okay. it might be difficult for you to keep track of both. So. What I'd request the people putting things in chat is if you don't mind, I mean, please go ahead and put them in chat, but you could also just raise your hand. I think Michael can see that more easily and then he can respond and, and pick that out. Is that okay, Michael? Okay, yeah, let me, uh, I, that's great. I, I want to have a conversation, but let me drive a little bit deeper into yeah. the substance. One, and... more, uh, small, one more small process suggestion, sorry to interrupt you. Is there a yeah, way sure. you can make the PowerPoint and presentation more? Right now we have slides in the overview mode. So if you can I'm hit sorry, the, what do you want? It, uh, yeah, if you can, in PowerPoint, in presentation mode, there should be a little picture of a projector at the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on. Let me let me fix that. Yes, by, yes, it, indeed. Uh, okay. That's well, that's friend. in slideshow. Okay. Slide show. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Panish. Uh, so let me start with an overall finding from our corporate transformation study. That is another way of saying what I've already said. We looked at, uh, at six trans corporate transformations in, de in depth and about 10 or so or 15 others in, more, in a more distanced way. But these were deep studies of these six companies. And what we learned was, and, and they were companies trying to respond to the Japanese competition in the late in the 80s, and this study was done in the mid mid to late 90, mid late eight to late 80s, and published in this book, the Critical Path to Corporate Renewal. That a lot of the failed programs, except for one of the six, started with this what the notion of what we call the fallacy of programmatic change, that the leader had some sub idea of what they wanted to do, either from other what was going on in the world around them, or because they had some predisposed notion and they developed a program of some kind, usually a training, a development program, uh, or some other programmatic effort for getting knowledge and changes and capabilities into the organization. Sometimes it was an organizational structural change, uh, which also didn't work. Uh, and what tended to work was the recognition by companies, uh, and I will get to this, that basically their job is to go ahead and state a direction and, and, and create change at the corporate and at multiple units. I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, the problem we've been talking about is organization silence. silence. Truth cannot speak to power. Uh, here's a financial service CEO, uh, firm CEO. No one ever told me the whole truth. This is what he said after he learned the whole truth uh, from a process. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a process we developed, which was an action research process from which, uh, which is basically a co-investigatory process between uh, the senior management, the rest of the organization represented as you'll see by, by a, a smaller sample and the scholar consultant, the three elements talking to each other in a conversational manner about what needs to be done in either one or in many, many conversations over time. Um, so here's an example of what silence uh, creates, okay? Uh, this is just from one organization, the Hewlett Packard Santa Rosa Systems Division and the division in Hewlett Packard. I won't go into it, but just look at these. 
Uh, and you can see that this is really holding back what was a set of uh, a new business, uh, business put together by Hewlett Packard to compete in a whole market, different market. I don't think I need to get into detail. Just look at the kind of comments uh, that uh, the senior HR executive came to me with, she thought were some problems uh, when she first heard me talk about what I'm about to talk about and said, we need this. <laughs> this was this process I'm, I'm, about, I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so what underlies this? What is it that, you know, it, these are specific problems to this organization. What underlies this? Uh, and I am going to be discussing with you a six silent, what I call silent killers. These are our abstractions of conversations that reveal the kinds of things I just talked about. But they're really an analysis, let me be absolutely clear. They are an analysis across many organizations, actually 24 where we did content analysis of what a task force of eight people reported, and I'm gonna come back to the process that, we, that they used, reported were the barriers to their organizations, including the one I just talked about, to executing their direction, their strategic goals, their strategic strategy, and in some cases, their values. Uh, it, well, in all cases now, we ask about to define values. I'll get to the process in a minute, but this is what the content analysis, these are not their words, but our analysis of what they said. In many cases, they use some of these words, but not in all. The task forces came back to senior management in an honest conversation, which I'll describe, which is not easy to do because as somebody said, truth will not speak to power. That's why they're silent. That is, this is, everyone knows that this is true. It's not that they totally don't, aren't aware, but like hype, so it's like hypertension or cholesterol. If you, if you, they cause a heart attack because people don't know it in the body, but in a human system, an organizational system, uh, everybody knows it, but they're talking about it behind closed doors in small groups over the cooler, but it's not a collective conversation. That is senior management isn't engaged in understanding these nor are all the different views of these things ever coalesced together to get a coherent systemic view. So individually, they're complaints. Collectively, they actually present a picture. And that's how management often hears it. You hear it from individuals, it's a complaint. Oh gosh, another one of these, somebody who's willing to speak up complaining. Well, together, integrated from multiple sources, this is what task forces said. They interviewed 100 people, generally 100, 150 in some cases, across the whole corporation or the whole system in a division, all the functions, all the regional sales, et cetera. Uh, unclear strategy values and conflicting priorities. Well, management had thought they were clear, but not so. I'm just reporting what lower levels saw. This is important. This is how they see it not how management sees it. An ineffective senior team. Uh, I can go into these in detail. Uh, in chapter four of my book, I describe the Santa Rosa system division and analyze how these things really actually worked in that particular division. But these are true across the board. Uh, there are six of them. Leadership behavior, too top down, not involved getting people involved at all, as somebody said they need to do, laissez-faire, uh, not engaged enough in the senior team or with the organization around identifying key tension points and working on solving them, usually uh, things that are preventing the organization from moving forward. This is a big one that actually is the implementation component poor coordination across business functions or geographic regions, uh, depending on the size and complexity. In a division, it's functions. In a corporation, it's all three. Uh, in, a, in a single business, it, it geographically organized, it's just regions. But in most organizations, this is really becoming a three-dimensional, and in some cases, four and five-dimensional problem. Customers are often another cut, and so on. 
Uh, inadequate leadership, management skills, and development is what these task forces also reported. We don't have, you know, we're the, in fact, we learned just by through trying and working with different companies, when we asked for the eight of the best people, this is what we asked for on this task force, they said, well, they don't have enough time. Well, <laughs> they're the best, you don't have another, another set of eight or 10 best people? No, these are the, well, that's just a manifestation of the problem. In, 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 at the Hewlett Packard Santa Rosa System Division, they decided to reorganize as a matrix. When we looked for managers who could lead program and uh, business teams, they didn't have any. Uh, they couldn't identify enough. So they had to find with an alternate solution, which is double hatting people, whatever, whatever the solution is. But we, I found this problem over and over again, particularly as you get into complex organizations. And this is it, Low, organization silence, the lack of capacity. We, we task forces said to the interview, uh, people to told the interviewers on a task force, we've known about these problems for some time. Uh, I've even talked to some people about it, but nothing has ever happened. Indeed, one of the things that I've learned is that most people don't think the organization can change, which is a serious problem if you really think about it because it prevents engagement in making the place better. So these are the silent killers. Uh, what I'd like to do is to have